we on a Sunday morning. Um, uh, I'm spending on the Sunday for a Sunday morning with the program. Uh, the field of cell therapy has gotten so big that we almost take a full symposium to go over the advances in So I will try to summarize some of that in uh, 40 minutes. So I will start with uh, a background that will uh, provide the audience for for the advances that have been made in the last few years or so. Uh, it's a rapidly advancing field, and, uh, and the work started about 10 years ago. I do not remember to disclose this slide. I remembered it yesterday, but then I uh, learned so much about EP that was that memory was a bit out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I, I forgot completely. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have anything to disclose anyway. So that helps. Um, this was the first study that came out uh, back about 10 years ago and, uh, in nature, in which the investigators used uh, bone marrow cells, the first demonstration that bone marrow cells can be used to repair the heart. And um, many negative CT positive bone marrow cells were, uh, I don't know if I can even say it in, in, in a way. Uh, so this uh, many negative CT positive bone marrow cells that uh, were used uh, from, the, uh, from the mice, and the mice were infected, and the cells were injected at the borderline uh, between the infarct zone and the health myocardium. The cells populated the myocardial area the scar thickness to improve, the myocardial function improved, and the mice long, uh, the, the survival was prolonged in the mice. So this study formed the basis of uh, the uh, several thousand studies that have been performed over the last 10 years or so. And it was translated very quickly to humans within uh, one year. This uh, study was performed in Germany, in which one of cells were harvested from patients who came with myocardial infarction, and they were injected down the infarcted artery that PPC balloon. And the cells uh, populated the infarct area, and it was shown that the heart function improved in these cells. It was a small group of uh, patients who were studied in this particular project. Uh, patients were followed up for a few months, and uh, <coughs> what this slide shows on the left at the top is the pattern scans of the patients before the cell therapy was instituted. You can see this green area which shows the infarct zone with uh, very little proportions of the pattern scan. Um, in the next step one, you see, you see the septum, which also does not show much perfusion, and this one, the short exit image shows um, the infarct zone. Three months later, after bone marrow cell therapy, the perfusion in the anterior wall improved significantly in these patients, and the, the stroke volume index also improved in these patients. There were less LD excess volume, volume which uh, means the cardiac function improved. And by adding, of course, the area of uh, perfusion improved in patients who were treated with uh, bone marrow. Since then, there have been a number of studies that have been used uh, in using cells from adults mostly. I could not discuss uh, any of the cells uh, that have been used from the embryonic origin. Uh, there have been bone marrow cells uh, that have been negative and CD positive, there have been bone marrow from nuclear cells. Mesenchymal stem cells, which also come from the bone marrow, they form the hydrogen supporting cells in the marrow stroma. And there have been circulating progenitor cells which are found in the blood and they can easily harvest in patients and, and, uh, and injected in the coronary artery. <coughs> there are some newer types of cells that are coming up. Uh, some of them are called uh, B cells. These are very small embryonic like stem cells. They also come from adults and uh, they are very effective and they are fully broken. There have been two, at least two, there are probably ten, two that have been tried in clinical trials. There are about ten different types of cardiac cells. I was involved with uh, one of those types at the CT plus because uh, it was a movie, and uh, that is being tried in humans now in a clinical trial. Um, and of course, there are cells from the adipose tissue which also can affect the heart. <coughs> the, the thing is really like this. Huge philosophy which says my cell is better than your cell. <laughs> Essentially, in humans, when we when we inject cells, uh, that involves a PTC catheter in most cases, in which you put out an infarcted artery, you inflate the balloon, and when the cells are injected with the balloon up, the cells have nowhere to go but to go to the infarct area. 
And the other situation, so the other way to inject such influence would be when the chest is open and you can take one of the and inject them in the pain of area under direct visualization, but that is appropriate for patients who are having an open heart procedure. So for most patients, actually, the intracoronary valve is more effective. In cell therapy was so great, you see these individual guidelines now, but, uh, but we have not so far. And the reasons, um, main reasons, are disparate results from different groups. So for example, in two papers they published in 2006 in England and Germany, back-to-back papers. <coughs> in one, in Germany, um, they used uh, 204 patients, they enrolled 204 patients, and randomized them to receive uh, placebo on myself. After four months, the improvements in LDEF was significant. And they also noticed improvement in adverse events during follow-up. In the same in the same issue as named the journal, there was a study from Norway in which the investigators used the same type of cell and bone monolithic cells and used uh, or enrolled 100 patients in which they did not see any evidence of heart repair um, for after six months follow-up period. So these papers have have uh, muddied the data, I would say, or uh, it become it made it unclear how prominent and how useful uh, bone marrow cell therapy is. So to give you a background of how we measure the effects of bone marrow cell therapy, I would just briefly go over the parameters that we measure. I don't think I have to explain what ejection fraction is. Um, so we, we uh, measure different fraction of patients who have cell therapy, that's a good measure. We also look at the volumes, uh, which is a systolic volume and systolic volume, which gives us an idea of how remodel the heart is and uh, how good the uh, scar repair is. The other parameter that we follow is <coughs> infarct size. This is an acute infarct size which could not be uh, checked in humans. But we have surrogate measures of infarct size which can be either by allium or uh, or uh, written by echo and sometimes it will be grabbed between by the egg and it wall and uh, <coughs> you get a you get an idea of how big the infarct is and how good the repair is. SPEC is perhaps one of the most useful, uh, useful modalities that have been used. Uh, as you can see here, for example, this is at rest, and so that is uh, a good indicator of how big the infarct is. <coughs> Since the field has, has provided or, uh, or generated this coordinate data, we published a meta analysis back in 2007 that kind of gave the field a guidance as to uh, what would be the most useful way to do the studies. Um, we revised our, our data, or our analysis, uh, in 2011. This has been accepted for presentation of the American Heart in November. Uh, I will just briefly go over what we found, because this kind of summarizes uh, what has been done over the past 10 years. We screened about 1,554 studies, and we found 42 studies that were eligible. And a total of 2,416 patients were enrolled. There were 1,330 patients who received bone marrow cells, and 1,204 patients who received placebo, that means standard therapy for myocardial infarction. These are SKL which minimized, as well as chronic myocardial infarction. We included both uh, types of studies. As you know, there are two types of clinical trials that we can do. One is a randomized control trial, in which the patients are um, randomized into two groups. Or we can do a cohort study where there is a control group, but there is no true randomization. And um, it can be argued that the cohort studies are not as kosher or, uh, uh, or do not generate as good data. But, but we included uh, both types of studies in this uh, for the purpose of analysis. When we analyze the LDJ infrastructure here in the blue boxes, uh, you see the mean for each study. On the left, the study does uh, in this set. The next number is the mean difference pre and post for the patients who receive bone marrow cells. And then the next uh, blue box shows you the same uh, parameters for control patients. And uh, on the right, this shows the treatment effect. On the right is the if it favors the bone marrow cells on the left, it favors controls. And this is a summary of only randomized control trials. The next set shows 
the data from cohorts. So what we see at the bottom here shows the net result of bone marrow cell therapy in patients uh, on injection fraction, and that's an increase by 3.4, 3.5% almost. So that's, a, that's not a small number. If you remember, streptokinase or the thrombotic therapy was uh, approved by FDA on the basis of a 4% increase in injection fraction. So 3.5% increase in injection fraction by bone marrow cells is not that small a number, although it appears small. We also examined uh, the effect of bone marrow cells on healthy and systolic volume. And this is a data from the RCTs, which shows a reduction in healthy and systolic volume by about 3 million. If we add the cohort study as well, the number goes up to approximately 6 milliliters. So here, there is a reduction in healthy and systolic volume by 6 milliliters that actually indicates that uh, patients with the bone marrow cells, their systolic function uh, of the heart has improved. And the end diastolic volume perhaps reflects uh, the remodeling process after the process more than anything else. So if we, uh, or when we analyze the data from the end diastolic volume, that shows in the RCTs there was a reduction by approximately 2 milliliters. And when you add the cohorts, that number goes up to approximately 3.4 million, which is a small number. In our previous analysis, the change in LDL diastolic volume was not significant. However, in this analysis, we more patients we saw and an effect on LDL diastolic volume as well. Infant size is uh, not easy to measure in humans. It can be done in experimental models, but they're not as reliable in humans because it's also a heterogeneous process. Uh, because different centers use different modalities to assess uh, and the uh, infant process. So uh, from the randomized control trials, we have a reduction in infant size of approximately 2.4%. And from cohorts, we have a reduction by approximately 5.6%. Uh, so the overall reduction in uh, patients who received bone marrow cells was approximately 2%, which is not a small number again, uh, because this will have a significant impact in the modeling going forward in these patients, which is nicely shown in the effect of bone marrow cells on adverse events during follow-up. So during follow-up, patients who, who were treated with bone marrow cells did show a significant decrease in all cause mortality, which is at the top. Um, cardiac deaths, um, recurrent amyloid, as well as the thrombosis. So these are important events that we, that we monitor when uh, during the follow up patient with the stereotype. And uh, it was interesting that bone marrow cell therapy, even just once, even after the reperfusion, impacted the outcome so, uh, so um, significantly. This also, it was reassuring to see that these data were consistent with what we saw back in 2006. The metallic cell published in archives uh, was the first of its kind, and uh, we had 18 trials and 999 patients. In this one, we have almost two and a half times as many patients, but the data are very, very significant and, and consistent. Injection fraction goes up by, uh, in the previous one, it was 3.7%. This time it went up by 3.5%. Scar size decreased by 5.5% in the previous analysis. In this one, it's 3. Ancestral volume went down by 4.8 million. And uh, in this analysis, it's 6 million. In the previous analysis, we did not see any uh, change in the endoscopy volume. Uh, increase in the number showed that LD and aspirin one also goes down. That means the remodeling of the heart is better. There are perhaps more questions that we don't know the answers to than what we know now. So, so that I, I think we'll show a Venn diagram which shows uh, the, the variables that we do not know what to do with. We do not know <coughs> which patient treatment would it be, would it be equally effective in patients with uh, acute myocardial infarction as well as chronic tissue heart disease. So there is a way in uh, what is called a sensitivity analysis in which you can look at full data from different trials and, and analyze the impact of one particular variable on the outcomes. And when we analyze data from patients who have been 
cancer therapy, and patients who had ischemic cardiomyopathy cancer therapy. The outcomes were significant on both sides, and there was no interaction that was significant except the LV cancer starting volume. And the cancer starting volume uh, went down by over 4 million in patients who had TMI. In patients with chronic ischemic cardiomyopathy, that number was much higher, which is about 11.4 million, and the interaction was significant. So, regardless of this difference in LV and systolic volume, what these numbers show is cell therapy is effective for both acute myocardial infarction patients and chronic ischemic cardiomyopathy patients. We also do not know if the baseline EF could impact the outcomes. Somebody can have can have a, an SLS MI and, and have an EF of 85%, and somebody can have an MI and have an EF of 35%. Now, would both of these patients are likely to benefit from stem cell therapy? The answer is not clear because the trials, in most trials, uh, the patients with the higher executive fraction are excluded these days. Although they were enrolled back in early 2000s, but we don't enroll anymore. So we did interaction analysis or sensitivity analysis with patients who had a baseline and injection fraction of less than 50%, uh, and uh, ones in which we had a baseline injection fraction of 50% or more. So 50, we took 50% because that is kind of the cutoff that is used by many industries as the presence of absence of any function. Again, the numbers are not significantly different on both sides, so it indicates that bone marrow cells have been affected for patients with less LV dysfunction or more LV dysfunction at baseline. Except in the main diastolic volume, if the baseline year was less than 50%, that the main diastolic volume improved by about 5 million, and it did not improve with patients who had can be this less than this function at this time, or in such fraction more than 50 percent. We also analyzed based on the median number of LV injection fraction in our 42 trials, and that number was 42 percent. And analysis was very similar, which showed that there is a significant difference in terms of LV gains as early volume. He was on the 0.03. However, it shows broadly that patients with less as well as more injection fraction of baseline are being said to benefit from bone marrow cell therapy. This is another question that we don't know the answer to. When to inject? So a patient may come and we want to inject the cell as soon as you go from the primary, or you want to delay it by a few days. So there is no answer again. There are some studies that are going on that are sponsored by the National Heart Lung Institute, but uh, there is no great trial that we have in the results from. So if we subject those data from previous trials to meta analysis, what we see the bone marrow cell therapy within five years after MI does not improve sexual interaction. Now, why? That's a huge question. We do not know why. It could be the cells that cells die if you throw them into an acute inflamed myocardium. That is possible because right after that infarction, there, there, there are so many side effects in that environment that the cells uh, may not survive long enough to make any impact. That could be many other reasons. So this is what we saw from our analysis, although the, although the interaction was not significant. <coughs> The improvement in sexual interaction for patients who receive from the results could be five days did not have <coughs> increase in sexual interaction. Overall, if you look at the numbers in these two columns, this one and this one, you will see the numbers are somewhat better in this group. In fact, star size is a bit better, ancestral volume is a little bit better, and endastral volume is a little bit better. So it almost suggests, this data suggests, but do not prove that a delayed injection is better. But, but there are studies that are going on right now which will address this issue within the next two years or so. Which are? Sometimes we do not have a choice 
a little if a patient has open heart surgery, maybe that patient will benefit from a direct injection into an artery. And sometimes a patient uh, may not have an open heart procedure, and even if we want to inject cells into my heart, maybe we don't have an option. So when we analyze these two the data from these two procedures, the benefits of DMC therapy were comparable to both sides with intracoronary as well as intracardiac. Except that the scar side reduction, which is the here, was a little bit better with intracoronary. In fact, the scar side did not reduce much with intracardiac injection and it was a little bit better. Now, we do not know the answer to it, but it is possible if you inject, if you inject cells into a heart wall which is actively contracting. It is possible that the cells are ejected as soon as you put them in. Uh, with intracoronary injection, sometimes it is better, sometimes it is more feasible that the cell will actually attach to the coronary endothelium and slowly go out into the myocardium, and it should give the better chance to survive and also to be in the myocardium for a better length of time. If, in fact, it has been shown in animal studies that you inject cells into the myocardium. Uh, it comes out, almost 70% of it comes out in future. How many cells should be here? Because at the beginning, well, there, were, uh, there were studies in which billions of cells were injected, and there were some studies in which 2 to 4 million cells were injected. So it's a huge range, and we do not know what's optimal. What we, when 107 million was the median number again in our in our uh, 42 studies, and when we analyze the numbers based on meaning the improvement in different parameters based on in studies that inject less than 107 million and studies in which they inject more than 107 million, the interaction was surprisingly not significant. So what these data show that if we so the cell number does not really matter that much. So perhaps this is an issue of quality over quantity, and this would be an important factor going forward because there are initiatives all over the world to find the best cell, and perhaps that's where we should focus more rather than trying to inject a lot of cells, which may actually end up causing more damage than good. At least based on these data that we have now, there is no difference based on cell numbers. So. So typically, the NIH-sponsored studies are using about 110 million cells, uh, monitor cells, at present. There was also a question at the beginning that whether the effects of one viral cell therapy will last for a long time. There were a couple of studies which came out in early 2000s, and the follow-up data showed that the benefits that were seen early on, by like in one year or so, they disappear as the patients were following for several years. So this question came up, is it all because of a parathyme effect? So if, if you have a cell that, that you put into the body anyway, the cell will perhaps release some of the factors that, are, that may exert local effects, which should be as long-lived as the factors themselves. So we will have those effects for a few months, and after that, when the cell dies or the factor goes away, the benefits will go away. So when we analyzed, based on different lengths of follow-up, that was zero to three months, four to six months, not all studies were followed up or provided follow-up data for a long time, the differences did not go away between the controls and, and, um, and the being treated patients. So the improvements stayed significantly for as long as we could generate data or have data. So in most cases, the follow-up duration was more than 12 months. But is 12 months enough? Probably not. But we do not have the data to support uh, that, that effects will last longer. So this is what we have now based on the analysis, which shows that the effects last at least 12 months or longer. So for the future, or Actually, currently, what is going on is we are doing not we, but in various centers uh, across the across the world. Uh, uh, head to head comparison between cell types are being performed, in which the uh, superiority of one type of cell will be established in one study rather than depending on the analysis. In the past, also, uh, 
the methods that are as rigorous as they should be, perhaps, because injection fraction by CAD or injection fraction by ECHO are maybe subjective in some cases, as we all know. So, MRI perhaps would be a more gold standard, but prior studies did not use MRI as frequently as the current ones. So, the data that we generate from the current studies will be much more robust. Also, uh, previous studies have been in between patients in some cases, and that does not give a, a lot of confidence in data. So, so a lot of studies have been done right now, which has hundreds of patients. And longer follow, of course, will be a key to know exactly what cells do or a previous follow up. So how can we improve outcomes? And that's where the experiments are going on right now. We can only find better cells which will either make more cytokines, or the or have you. Or we can modify the cell with gene control factor. We can treat the cell to make it better. And we can use biomaterials with cells that can support the cell when it's in the market. I will, I will go over just briefly because of time, only a few uh, points on this picture. Uh, so, uh, we have been working on a cell type which is called very small and beyond the like stem cell. So, this is from adult bone marrow, and they are also from adult organs. But they have some features which suggest that they have more of an embryonic character to them. And they are very rare, they are approximately 0.001% of the cells of bone marrow. And we identify them with uh, markers on the cell surface, which is R1 positive, luminous negative, and C45 negative. These are very small cells. The diagram on the right shows how we, how we isolate them from the bone marrow. This is a, a fax plot, basically, and it shows that we separate them from the multiple cells, which is C45. And we take the cells that are C45 and negative. And these are they can differentiate into uh, different lineages. In, uh, we did uh, an animal study several years ago, and uh, in which we injected uh, very small and large stem cells uh, into pocket mice. What it shows on the left, the, this is the control group. This is the group with the uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, and this is the group with Instant transplant. The chamber diameter is smaller and the heart function was better in this mice. On the right, it shows in the structure also improves. There are more islands of mice in the scar area, which may mean that these cells have become cardiomyces or they have established cardiomyces that are persisting in greater numbers within the scar. We also, there have been a lot of studies going on right now, how to modify these cells. So when you get a cell from the, from the bone marrow and, uh, and expand it in culture, uh, there are different ways that you can modify. First, you can use uh, genetic modification. So for putting in growth factors or other factors that we think are beneficial, uh, for example, AKT, these are, these are all molecules with long history behind them of being beneficial to the heart. And that's what is uh, a lot of effort is going on right now in modifying the cell in this factor that we know to be good. The other option would be to treat the cell in the culture before it is injected. And in that category, we have growth factors, uh, which are again cytoprotective, IGF-1, and other factors. We have colonoplasma agents, which will make it a myocyte. We can precondition the cell so that it will live longer or will not undergo apoptosis. And we can co culture with cardiomyocytes in our head. And after this type of treatment, you take the cell or uh, make a solution and, uh, and inject it into the heart. We have focused on one molecule that's called <coughs> wind 11. Wind 11 is one molecule out of 19 wins that act through non canonical pathways. I will not go into the details. I just wanted to show that when we treated these cells with Mindelevan, these cells mean bone marrow mononuclear cells. We, uh, we harvested bone marrow mononuclear cells and treated the cells with Mindelevan, and we observed by immunoscopic chemistry what changes these cells undergo. And these cells express markers that are consistent with cardiomyocytic phenotype. On the, in the top panel, you see commencing point here, which is a 
which is the molecule or it's the molecule that's expressed for the cells for, connect, for connecting with other cells. The cells also express uh, troponin T and cardiac mice intelligent. And the Mars image shows that the cells acquire cardiomyosin phenotype. We treat the cells with uh, one of the monolithic cells. Uh, we treated them with B11, harvested them, injected them in a mouse model of the protein. The lower panels show when we followed up this detection fraction in these mice, which were treated with vehicle control agencies and we will have treated in uh, These are not only in the cells. Um, the injection fraction improved after 21 days of follow-up compared with other groups. So there is something these cells are doing better compared with cells that were not treated and 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 people treated of this mice. So of course this will take a long time to focus and we transfer it to humans. Uh, and this is another uh, World presentation we have at this case right now. So, uh, so these are promising. We have some promising data that may be translated in the future. Uh, work from other groups have also uh, been progressing in the same area. For example, in this study, mesenchymal stem cells were transfected with uh, empty vector that means it does not produce any uh, empty profile. Uh, a paraspectral factor, HEO, or vascular endothelial growth factor. And uh, cells were injected after polymerization in mice, and the mice were followed up for six months. On the right, we see improvement in the uh, infant thickness in mice that received cells with modified hepatocytic growth factor and vascular energy growth factor. This is micro CT, which is much more reliable than injection fraction by echo. So that showed that injection fraction in mice that received cells with gene modification, the injection fraction was better. The panels at the bottom show happy rates by identified by staining. And the, uh, the quantitative numbers also show that the gene modification improved the happy rate numbers. The use of biomaterials that is becoming more and more common. So that means uh, some kind of scaffold or a material that is degradable is being used to support the cells of the initial part or initial generation in the myocardium. In this particular study, they use the biodegradable uh, aggregated hydrogen hydrogen. And cells were mixed with the hydrogen injected into the myocardium. This image shows the presence of these cells and the hydrogen in the improv area. This image shows the cells are here, injected cells, and the hydrogen is here. So it has started to disappear. So this is a good method to support the cells for the early part of their, uh, their residence in the myocardium. And the cells last longer. And after 30 days, the cells are still persisting in the myocardium, as you can see in the red color. So these are the cells that, are, that have been integrated in the myocardium. Next, I will go over briefly what, what stem cells can do in the field of EP. There are different ways stem cells can be used. And I, in my last year's talk, I began, I used a lot more slides on that would be specific. So one option, of course, would be to uh, use, a, use a tissue construct for part of the conduction pathway. Another option would be to use biological pacemakers that are made out of stem cells. And we can also use ablation techniques from pacemakers, and not pacemakers, but the cells that are modified with different balance channels. Mm -hmm. Let me go over a few of them quickly. So we don't have to explain how many different pacemakers are works. So there could be cells that we can put into the heart, for example, in the SNO. And the cells may be able to generate action potential to trigger the heart. This concept has been supported by the facts that we already know. Like it has been known for a long time that uh, embryonic stem cell denied cardiomyocytes have action potential. So if you culture them, these are the cells that are cardiomyocytes because this is troponin I, the cells are troponin I that means they have become cardiomyocytes. 
if you attach them to these cells, this is the data or actual potential from cluster of cells and these are single cells. So they're able to read or they're able to generate actual potential. In the bottom, it shows the connection for T, which is in red, which is a gap junction protein, which makes the cell connect with the other cells. Connection for it, right? So these cells do express markers of proteins that we help them connect. Ion channels are also expressed in adult mesenchymal stem cells from the formula. We would never know why cells that reside uh, within the formula would be ion channels. And they do have ion channels, including ion channels as the inward channels, but they also express outward channels. They have whole sets of channels that are actually present in the mass sites. We don't know why. But that gives us an opportunity to make these cells or use these cells for case-making purposes or conduction purposes. So it has been shown if you transplant a mesenchymal cells in the heart, it actually connects with the surrounding cells with connection for activities in the red. So with that notion, we can put cells in the in the practical conduction system, which will help conduct the electrical activity to the heart in case of burn branch block or maybe not block or whatever. And this has been shown by the Peter papers of the Rosen's group, which has shown the ability of cells trans transfected most commonly in HC to to generate case-making uh, potentials in the heart. For example, this study shows in a NIE model of AD block, mesenchymal stem cells were transplanted, and you can see on the top left panel here, biological casing is going on, and that is interrupted by electronic casing, and then followed by biological casing. So the cells with uh, HCL2 transfection are able to generate case-making potential that can sustain the uh, life of the animal. And on the right, uh, this is just a location of where the action process is already in the first thing from the setup. So that differentiates uh, or confirms where the case may be potential. The other approach is to use normal common cells, for example, HEK cells. In this study, the HEK293 cells were transmitted with SDN5A sodium challenge. So these cells in vitro connected with surrounding cardiomyocytes with, with, with connection point T, which is in white. So you can see this, in a petri dish, these cells, which are not cardiac, they can connect with cells of cardiac origin and they can conduct in pulse. Again, in a, in, a, uh, in vitro setting, this is not in vivo, there are two foci of action potential with the embryo bodies. And on day one, there is no connection between these two uh, action potential generating areas. On day 11, the cells, the HEK cells, which are taken in between, they are actually able to make these two foci be in a synchronous fashion. That indicates the cells that are non cardiac, if you transfer them in this in day, they do conduct action potential in a very effective way. The other option, and this is exciting, a lot of these things are kind of may take a few years to come to clinical fruition, but, but at least these are these are really new uh, frontiers. So in this study, the cells fibroblasts were transfected with a KP 1.3 and uh, injected into the ventricular apex in rats. You can see the cells uh, and surrounded by native myocardium or the host myocytes. On the right, uh, it's a magnified picture of the same, the blue cells are the injected cells. What it shows, the injection of cells makes the effective refractory period longer, at least locally. So the top panel shows before cell therapy, the ERP is approximately 60. Seven days after cell therapy, the ERP is 170. And when MTX, which is a specific KB 1.3 blocker was injected, it goes back down to 100. So this shows the cell therapy has the potential, perhaps, to treat ventricular failures. Although, as I said, this may take a long time before this comes to clinical fruition. 
I agree with for the other exciting uh, area, which is the use of rewarding stencil. This came out in 2007, in which uh, the cells from the skin or other organs can be made to behave like two rewarding stencils. So cells are taken from the skin, skin fibroblasts, modified with uh, retroviral transcription of four factors of three, four, subs, two, three, four, and three. They start to express markers of embryonic stem cells of three, four, and subs. This study came out last year uh, from a patient with long TG1 who have a mutation in KCN uh, gene 1, which is shown here. They took cells from the skin of the patient, made induced pluripotent stem cells out of those cells. Here you see the expression of nano and tra 1 and 1 which are markers of pluripotent cells. So the cells from the same patient can be made to grow cardiomyocytes in culture, which is shown here. And these cells do express KCN1, which is a mutated portion. So this gives you the opportunity to test patient-specific drugs. So you can put these cells from the same patient to which these make myocytes out of this. You don't need to do a microbial biopsy or anything. And these cells will last much longer than if you need to do a microbial biopsy. And you can test the effect of drugs on these cells. For example, these cells carefully capture the phenotype of the patient. So you see the actual potential is actually prolonged to a particular size from these uh, cells, and you can test the input of the drugs. And also these cells do prolong the AD. So earlier they do show the AD. So that means they are essentially acting as my cells on the patient. So this would be really phenomenal when it goes to concentrated operation. So in conclusion. Therapy adult bone marrow cells modestly increase heart structure and function in patients with serious heart disease. A number of variables remain to be optimized. Biological pacemakers, regeneration of the conduction system, and patient specific drug testing for present potential uses in the reality. And we need a lot more basic science studies to bring this to fruition or to the This is the Cardiovascular Research Institute. And this is our department. Thank you very much.